Great. Where was I? Right, yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually going to bio before I start my talk. Uh, so my name is Sam. I'm from London. Uh, I'm on the RSpec core team. Uh, if any of you saw my RailsConf talk, uh, you'll know the sweet tea joke, but otherwise, it doesn't really matter. So this is, this is what... <laughs> This is what is processor, and I think uh, with all of that said, we'll get started. So, like, if you enjoy following people who tweet a lot of nonsense, uh, I'm Sam Fippin on all relevant social networking sites. Kylie will tell you it's a bad idea to follow me on Twitter. Um, and before I get too far into this talk, I wanted to prefix it with an idea that this talk is full of convenient lies. A convenient lie is something that we as a group of developers believe or agree to be true so that we can actually work with computers as opposed to understanding the horrifying, unending chaos that actually lives inside them as we begin to take them apart. I suspect as a Ruby developer, you've never felt the need to understand what one of the billions of transistors inside your computer is actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, Basically, throughout this talk, I'm going to be describing a lot of models of how software works, how processes work, how electronics work. And most of these models aren't fundamentally true. They instead represent an idea that allows us to reason about what a computer is doing and make it a lot easier to get our jobs done. I also suspect that some of you in the room will know the things that I'm describing in a lot more detail than I do. And that's fine. The idea of this talk is not for me to give you a total understanding of how your computer works, but instead describe some interesting ideas about what's down there and hopefully like intellectually stimulate you as Ruby developers. Speaking of Ruby, I think, I think most of us are here at a Ruby user group tonight because we like programming Ruby better than we like programming most of the other programming languages that are available to us for building what are primarily going to be web applications. The thing about Ruby is it enables one to think at a level that is way above the computer in terms of the people that we interact with and the objects in our real world. Ruby is a programming language that allows us to write expressions like 3.days.go as opposed to new date time, system.current time minus 3 times 24 times 3600. When I'm working with newer developers, I like to call this thinking in terms of the domain. Most of us, when we build applications, aren't building applications to service computers, but rather people. We have shopping carts and line items and delivery addresses. We don't have bytes and processors and file systems. Whilst most of us spend our days thinking in terms of the domain in Ruby, the opposite would be considered thinking in terms of the computer. And it's worth noting that these two ideas aren't totally distinct. If my job is to develop drivers for a graphics card inside a laptop, then my domain actually overlaps with how the computer works. And that being the case, it might be necessary for me to not use a programming like Ruby that's totally abstracted. My domain concepts in building things in hardware overlap with computer concepts. And so these two ideas cross over. However, in Ruby, most often, we're not dealing with deeply technical stakeholders. We're dealing with business people and customers who just have a job they're trying to get done and don't want to build like crazy computer stuff in order to do so. And so one, way, one thing I really like about Ruby is it allows me to communicate to the computer in the same way I do with the non-technical people on the teams that I work on. And that's a really powerful thing that I think we all enjoy, and that's why some of us program Ruby. This is one way to measure abstraction of a programming language or a system. When you're writing Ruby, you're spending less time thinking about the computers than you would with some other programming languages. We can actually put these programming languages on a line of the amount they make us think about how the computer works. Now, unfortunately, a line isn't very good with a single point on it, so let's add another one. Let's think about Python. <laughs> Python, just like Ruby, is a dynamically typed programming language that has object systems and functions. People tend to build big libraries of code that you can reuse. And when you're writing Python programs, at least in my experience, you end up thinking mostly in terms of domain, just like you do in Ruby. And so I'm going to put Python at the same position as Ruby on this line. 
Now, I'm aware that might be a controversial thing to do at a Ruby user group like this. But let's just go with it. And if you fundamentally disagree that Python and Ruby give us similar amounts of abstraction, like come and have a yell at me at the end of this talk. So we've got two uh, programming languages at the same point on the amount of computers line. But where can we go? Well, we can go more or less computers here. And I'm going to start with less. And I think a programming language that lets us think less about what the computer does than either Ruby or Python is SQL. And let me explain why I think that. When you express a program in Ruby or Python, you're providing a top-down list of instructions that <laughs> Will's just pulled a really funny face. Hi, Will. <laughs> when, when you're writing a, programming, uh, a program in either Ruby or Python, you're writing a top-down list of instructions for the computer to execute. You have some idea of the order in which changes are going to be applied to the state of the system. And it's the understanding of these changes of state that enable you to reason about what your program's going to do and what the result is going to be. SQL is a fundamentally different idea. When you write a program or query in SQL, you're expressing a problem to the computer and asking it to come up for, with a solution for you. You have no control over how the program executes or what modifications to the state of the system are actually going to happen. You just know what result is going to come out at the end given the inputs that you provide. What you're effectively doing when you program in SQL is framing the problem and asking the computer to come up with a solution for you in any order. Those are the sheet parts. <laughs> See, it all comes together. So if SQL is a programming language that is more uh, abstract or makes us think less about the computer than either Ruby or Python, can we think of any programming languages that make us think more about what the computer is doing? And I'm going to posit that a perfect candidate for this is the C programming language. Now, I'm not going to say that like, C is the next level of abstraction down from either Ruby or Python. There's a very large gulf there, and hundreds of other programming languages that could fit in. However, like, I don't have the time to discuss the abstraction level of every single programming language with you, so we're just going to skip straight to C. Now, C holds a very mythical place in amongst programming communities. For a lot of programmers that have never used it, they've often been told C is the only way you can become a real programmer, or C fundamentally models what the computer does. Neither of those things are true, and I want to look at some of the actual differences between Ruby and Python and C, as opposed to just telling you the things that Hacker News would if you went there and read it. To look at one difference between Ruby and C, let's talk about how Ruby programs execute and how C programs execute. So I think most of you understand that when you write a Ruby program, that program cannot directly run on the computer that's been provided. Something else has to actually turn that program into something the processor can understand. And we commonly call that a Ruby interpreter. In this case, like most of us probably use Matz's Ruby interpreter, but there are others besides. And what happens when you run a Ruby program under a Ruby interpreter is that the interpreter starts reading the source code that you've written, consumes it, and then works out what instructions it actually needs to send to the processor in order to run that program. It dispatches those instructions to the processor and results are fed back to the interpreter. The interpreter then consumes the next line of your program, and so on and so on, until the execution of your program is complete. The important thing to note here is that in order to execute a Ruby program, the human readable source code and the Ruby interpreter have to be present at the same time in order for the program to be, uh, to be executed. And this is what it means for Ruby to be an interpreted programming language. The idea here is that there is no decoupling between source code and execution time. The Ruby source code has to be present at execution time in order for your program to run. The C programming language is different. It's compiled. This means that it doesn't run with an interpreter. And to show you how that works, let's imagine that we've got a C program and we want to run it. Well, the first thing that you're going to need to do in order to run your C program is compile it. And commonly, you'll use a tool like the GNU Compiler Collective in order to do that. <laughs> the result, <laughs> I'm not an artist. 
I don't know if that has yet become obvious, but I'm not an artist. So the result of compiling a source code C program is what's called a binary. And just like the Ruby interpreter generating instructions that can be dispatched to the processor, this is what the compiler has done. The difference is that the binary that is produced is actually a file that gets saved to disk for later execution. When you write a C program, it doesn't get executed when it's turned into instructions, but instead those instructions get executed at a later time. So in other words, I can take this binary and I can provide it to the processor later in order to be able to run my program. And the thing that's worth noting here is that execution time and source code are completely separate in this model. Because C isn't as quite dynamic as Ruby and doesn't have quite as many exciting features, we're actually able to compile it, produce the instructions ahead of time, and then run it later. And this is one difference between how Ruby executes and how C executes. But we haven't really touched on why the C programming language is considered to be a low-level programming language. And to do that, I'm going to need to delve into the annals of history, specifically to this computer, the PDP-11. Now, I was going to actually look up how old this computer was, but when I was writing my talk, my dad happened to glance over my shoulder, and he said to me, that's the computer that I first programmed when I started being a programmer before you were born. <laughs> At this point, I was like, cool, that computer is so old that I don't even need to look up how old it is. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> no, but so the C programming language was actually invented for this computer. And the reason is that the PDP-11 had a feature inside its processor that wasn't present in previous ones called byte addressable memory. Now, the thing about this is that because this was a new feature in the computer, there hadn't yet been invented programming languages which could target that feature. And so the C programming language was born in order to actually enable people to write code for the PDP-11 without having to directly program its processor, which I think is like a really interesting thing where like computers drive out new programming languages. But this means that C doesn't actually model like the processor inside our modern computers today. It actually models processors that are much, much older than that one. And so like, when people tell you that C is totally how the machine executes code, what they're really telling you is that like, I really enjoy modeling a PDP-11 in my day-to-day -day programming life. And like, I don't know about you, but that's not something I need to do in order to like send to-do lists down a web socket. So the way C programs actually end up executing on modern computers is like the compiler is doing incredible work to convert this like execution model from the 1970s into something that can actually be dispatched on our like much, much more powerful Intel processors today. And so like, it's just nonsense if people tell you that like, you're not a real programmer if you don't know C, because like, they're not programming the PDP-11 either, or at least I hope most of them aren't anyway. The other thing that C exposes that Ruby doesn't is the idea of how memory works inside a computer. Ruby is what's called a garbage collected programming language. That means when you create objects and then like stop using them, the Ruby interpreter just kills the memory that's associated with that object for you. In the C programming language, it doesn't have that feature. Because it's compiled, there is no runtime watching out for the objects that you create for you. And so in C, memory allocation, access, and release have to be managed by the programmer. But the thing is, the way this is actually modeled in C uses concepts called a stack and a heap, which like, aren't innately true to the physical sense of what memory is. And so again, that's just one model of how execution works. So that's a quick tour through the C programming language, and we're now going to move down into assembly. Assembly is the last textual representation of software I'm going to talk about before we move back to those binaries I was referring to earlier. And to talk about assembly, I first need to explain the concept of a register. So I suspect when most of you are programming, you're used to the idea of introducing local variables into functions that you're writing. Local variables don't actually exist in assembly because assembly is just designed to be 
a like, list of instructions to the processor. The other thing that's really important to note is that on like a modern computer, if you look at it, the RAM, the main memory, is entirely separate from the processor. And while it may seem to like us humans that that RAM is really, really fast, on the scale of how fast a processor executes, memory is far away and slow. The solution to this for using temporary data inside a processor is called a register. And a register is a tiny piece of memory which can be accessed very, very quickly. Because it's so small, they can place a lot of them all over the processor in order to provide fast access to temporary data. So that's registers. Now let's look at an actual assembly program. An assembly program is a textual list of instructions that's a completely flat. There's no hierarchy. When you write assembly, you don't have things like local variables, if statements, loops, each, or any kind of control flow. It's just providing a one-to-one -one list of what the processor will actually do when this program is provided to it. Each line of assembly represents a single instruction for the processor, and each line has multiple parts. The first part of the line is what's called the operation, and this is what the processor is actually going to do when it encounters this instruction. Typically, we represent instructions to move pieces of data around with the keyword MOV, which stands for move. Each instruction also has a number of what are called operands, and you can think of these as arguments to a function. Basically, if the, in if the instruction is the function to modify the state of the processor, then the operands are the arguments that will determine what that function actually does. And so here we have an instruction MOV with the operand 3 and the operand $C. Here I'm using $C to denote a reference to a register inside the processor. And so, we have a pro uh, and so we have a program here with three instructions, two of which are moving values around, and one of which is adding values together. To show the execution of this program, we move the value 3 into the C register, we move the value 4 into the D register, and then we uh, add the registers C and D together and store the result in the register A. So basically what we've done here is we've created a program to put two values into registers on the processor and then add them together. In this way, we can express more complicated programs by building them out of simple building blocks. And this is how uh, modern programs actually gets translated for execution onto processors. It's worth noting that, as I said, this is a textual representation. And so assembly programs themselves still need to be compiled and still need to be executed at a later time. The textual representation of the assembly can't be directly executed on the processor. It's also worth noting that there's a difference between C and assembly, uh, which is to do with how the programming languages work. C is what's called a universal programming language, which means that it can be compiled for execution on any processor. There's nothing special about C that prevents you from changing whether it runs on your phone or your laptop or something different. But with assembly programs, they have a specific dialect or assembly language which needs to be targeted at a specific processor. And so I can write a pro a, an assembly program, for example, for an x86 processor, which is the kind of processor that will live inside my laptop, or an ARM processor, which is typically the kind of processor that will live in my phone. But these dialects are different, and so I won't be able to run the same assembly program on both types, unlike a C or Ruby program. So that's assembly. And now we need to talk about binary. And binary is basically the result of the compilation step that I was talking about earlier. These are the files on your disk that are a result of compilation, or what the Ruby interpreter generates as it's running. It's worth noting that the assembly programs I was talking about just a minute ago map one-to-one -one onto binary programs that can be executed. Just like an assembly program is a top-down list of textual instructions, a binary program is a top-down list of numbers which express those instructions in a format that can be sent directly onto the processor with no additional compilation or intermediate steps. You can break apart uh, binary instructions just as you can assembly ones, and so just as before, we have our operations and operands in each instruction. Here we have up to three operands per instruction. So now I'm going to talk about how this stuff actually ends up getting executed inside the processor. 
It's worth noting this is just one model of execution, and there are others besides that I'm not going to go into incredible detail today. But the thing to note is that like, if you understand this model, this is basically how your modern computer actually runs the, the assembly programs, just like much faster and in a more complicated way. So the model I'm going to be discussing is called Fetch, Decode, Execute, Retire, or FDER for short. And we're going to go through each one of these steps, showing you how one instruction will be dispatched onto a modern computer. So if this is our processor, the first step we need to discuss is fetch. <laughs> the thing to note here is that processors on their own would be very, very sad bits of hardware. They need collaborators in order to be able to get things done. And the two that I'm going to be considering this evening are main memory and the processor. So let's imagine we've got a binary program and we've decided to execute it. The first thing that will happen is that program will get loaded into the main memory of your computer. And you can see here that we have three instructions at addresses 0, 1, and 2. In order to begin executing that program, the processor needs to know where to look. And to know where to look to find instructions, the processor has a register, those tiny bits of memory I was talking about earlier, called the program counter. And the job of the program counter is to tell the processor where to look in memory in order to find an individual instruction. So in this case, the program counter is set to zero, and so the processor will go out to address zero in order to be able to fetch the instruction. <coughs> Excuse me, can I get some water? <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Um, so the processor will pull that instruction out of address zero, and then it will try and load it. It has a second register inside it called the instruction register, or IR for short. And basically, that value transports from main memory back into the instruction register and gets loaded. The job of the instruction register is to make the instruction available and easy to read for the processor during execution time so that it doesn't have to go out to main memory again and again in order to be able to understand the instruction. So that's the fetch step. Its job is basically to pull instructions out of memory and into the processor. The next step is decode. And the job of decode is for the processor to work out what it's actually going to do when it receives this instruction. So let's imagine we have an instruction whose job it is to add the numbers 1 and 2 and store the result in register C. This might get encoded as this number that I've shown below, but then the processor has to work out what to do with that number when it receives it. In this case, it's going to break it down as the first part means add, the second part means value 1, the second part means value 2, and the third part means register 3. With all of that in mind, the processor can then begin get, to get ready to execute the instruction. So let's just zoom in on our model and show... Thank you very much. And then get ready for execution. Just to show you the other parts of the processor that are going to be involved here, we're going to have a number of registers and also some units that can actually do stuff inside the processor. Now, here we have three units down the right-hand side. Uh, in, in this case, memory, uh, the arithmetic logic unit, which is basically the unit that handles all addition, subtraction, math operators, and Boolean operations, and I.O., which does things like handle your keyboard and mouse. This is a simplification, but basically, given that we know we're going to be doing an add instruction, the processor will wake up the part of the processor responsible for doing adding, and also the C register. These are the two pieces of hardware inside the processor that are actually going to be used for this operation, and so it needs to get ready before it can actually execute them. So in the decode step, our processor prepares itself for execution. The execute step is where computation is actually performed, and just to sort of further eliminate complexity, we'll get rid of all the bits of hardware that are there and also just move a few things around for space. So at this point, the processor has already decoded the instruction and it knows it's going to be adding two values together and those values are going to be one and two. All of that information gets sent to the subunit of the processor that is responsible for performing the computation and it produces the result, which in this case is three. So in the execution phase of the fetch, decode, execute, retire model, uh, the execution's job is to actually perform any computation as necessary. 
The retire phase is when we actually confirm our results back to the real world. So in this case, the unit responsible for doing the math will tap the result out, put it back in the C register, and then prepare the uh, processor for the next stage of execution by clearing the instruction register and incrementing the program counter. The reason we increment the program counter going back to our program from earlier is so that when the processor wants to fetch the next instruction, it's ready to pull the next address. And this process basically just repeats 3 billion times per second, and that's how programs get executed. You have this long list of instructions in memory, and the processor is pulling each one in, preparing itself, executing, and storing the results. Kind of. I'm still definitely lying to you. <laughs> to quickly recap, the job of the fetch phase of the fetch decode execute retire model is to get instructions from memory and load them into the processor so it can access them quickly. The job of the decode step is to prepare the processor for execution. Any registers or units it might need inside itself uh, get activated. In the execute step, the processor actually performs the computation as necessary in order to produce results. In the retire step, those results are rooted into the appropriate places, and we clean up after ourselves, getting ready for the next instruction. Repeating this cycle three billion times a second gives us the incredible, powerful computational results that we're able to unlock today. And I think it's really useful to be able to at least begin to understand what's going on inside your computer in order to get some like ability to reason about how higher level programs such as Ruby execute. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Sam Fippin on Twitter and GitHub. My email address is sam at funimplausible.com. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Questions? I'm aware that's not really Ruby, but. <laughs> no? <laughs> I will. All right. Oh. I have one. I don't know if it's something that Kevin really went through with you, but I keep thinking about thread processing, like threading. Uh huh. Is there anything you can address, like, what's happening there? Yeah, absolutely, I can. So. Oh, right. Thank you. Yes. So the question was, like, I've just described a very simple single-threaded model of how computation works. <laughs> how does it work in a multi-threaded case? Which is actually a really good question. So I'm going to ignore the case where multiple threads execute on a single core, because that's really annoying to deal with. Um, but so if you have um, multiple cores and you have multiple threads, then basically the, each core on your processor has its own program counter. And so it can point to like a different place in memory uh, separate from another one in order to do like different computation at the same time. So for example, if you're running uh, two processes each with one thread, like the way operating systems work essentially guarantee that they can't touch each other's memory modulo lies. Um, I'm lying like a lot to you this evening. Um, and so they can just have completely independent program counters, right? And then those calls can go at their own pace and execute the programs. Uh, however they need to. So like the way, uh, one way you can think of it is that like basically your program is a big queue of instructions and each core that you have inside your system just consumes a different queue. Um, because uh, the processor knows that the like temporary local results from individual threads can't affect each other, it's able to actually make all sorts of assumptions about how data inside your processor gets rooted. But like, a more like to peel back like another layer, the um, fetch the code execute retire model totally does assume like single core, single thread, like one program executing at a time. And like modern operating systems, you know, are running hundreds, thousands of threads simultaneously. And so what actually happens is like um, when the thread of execution currently running has some reason to stop, like it waits on I.O. or it sleeps, um, the stream of instructions going to the processor will actually get swapped out. Um, and then it will continue begin executing those. And because results aren't visible, like 
outside of the processor apart from writes to memory. It can do all sorts of shenanigans about like what it's storing inside itself um, and making back available to the operating system. So like that question is probably a whole second talk in of itself to explain accurately, but does that sort of give you some intuition about how it works? Absolutely. Great. Any, yep. Uh huh. Ooh. <laughs> so, 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 is this this is going on the internet, right? Okay. So, sorry. Let, let me let me repeat the question first. So, the question was: I had my uh, chart of less abstract to more abstract programming languages. Where would I put JavaScript? Okay. So. I'm giving this talk on Friday in St. Augustine, Florida as a keynote at a Ruby conference. Um, and one of the people who's going to be there is a very good friend of mine who also works for NPM. And so I very deliberately took any references to JavaScript out of this talk <laughs> so as like to be politically neutral. Um, so because this talk is not that talk, um, I will actually give you some opinions. Um, so I think... Um, I would actually say JavaScript makes you think more about the computer than either Ruby or Python does, but also less in some ways, um, because at least client-side JavaScript doesn't like cannot touch a file system, cannot touch hardware. Like a bunch of that stuff, like is just impossible to even have to reason about. Um, so, okay. When I said this talk was convenient lies, this is like one of the big ones. Originally, this talk was going to be three convenient lies, but that itself was a lie. So <laughs> the convenient lie around that line of abstraction is that like abstraction is linear. Like the real truth is it's a complex multi-dimensional space. And so like it's not, I don't think it's actually meaningful amongst like super localized clusters of programming languages to have this argument. So like, I would probably like on that line put JavaScript in the exact same place. Um, other people would put it in a different place and that's fine because like the truth of it is like, it's really complicated and like you can, you can sort of like, only the ends are meaningful, like the middle is very fuzzy. So like, I could not, for example, necessarily tell you where I would put a programming language like Rust on that line, which like has abstractions, but also exposes you to memory, or like C++, which is a giant mess. So like the answer is JavaScript is fine. It definitely allows you to build very powerful abstractions, um, but I don't necessarily know whether I would describe it as more or less abstract than Ruby. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, any, any more for any more? <laughs> no? Going once, twice. Thanks. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.